2009 started on a high note, as Ghanaians celebrated a peaceful handover of power, when opposition leader John Atta Mills was inaugurated as the new president, after an election widely seen as free and fair. The least that I can do is to work hard in order to help all of us achieve a better Ghana. I will be president for all Ghanaians, whether they voted for me or not. Across two borders in Guinea, there was an altogether different handover of power. When President Lansana Conte died just before Christmas, after 24 years in office, a group of army officers led by Daddy Camera took advantage of the vacuum to take over. They were welcomed as heroes by thousands of Ghanaians, fed up of decades of autocratic rule and an economy weakened by corruption and mismanagement. Guinea should have held elections this year, and voters were already being registered, a process that Kamara promised to continue, although at the time he said he wanted to leave politics to the politicians. But this seemed to have changed when we interviewed him later in the year, in October. So, the Guineans will regret the day when I quit this power. All the Guineans, take a note and write your note. The people of Guinea will regret the day that I leave power. Everyone in Guinea will. Take note of these, because you have to keep a record for history. After me, no one will be able to manage this army. Even within the army, if someone tried to make me live today, the soldiers will take up arms and start to fight amongst themselves, and no one in the civilian population knows how to control the army either. Already discontent was spreading. Protests at the end of September had turned ugly when the police opened fire and scenes eerily reminiscent of similarly violent protests that had taken place under Lansana Conte. Except this time, the security forces were accused of raping as well as killing. The military junta put the death toll at 57. Independent sources say more than 150 people died. Many just disappeared, their bodies never found. With the year about to end, security has been stepped up after Kamara was shot this December by his own soldiers. He survived, but right now the democracy that many hope for from the elections planned for January seems an elusive prospect. Gabon also entered a new era when its president, Omar Bongo, died in June. He'd been Africa's longest serving head of state, in power for 42 years. Elections to replace him were held on August 30th. The country is one of Africa's leading oil producers, but an estimated 60% of its people live in poverty. So many saw this as an opportunity to bring change. Bongo's son, Ali Ben Bongo, was tipped as his likely successor, standing as the candidate for his father's party, the Gabon Democratic Party, or PDG. But when polls closed, both he and the other front runner declared themselves victorious. La Cour constitutionnelle, et je dis, et avant elle, la Sénat ne pourra pas. The Constitutional Court will not and cannot confirm what was said this morning because we all have representatives at the polling stations and when we put the results together, the candidate of the Gabon Democratic Party cannot win the elections. It is clear. The results show that he was in third position. Today, we have received information from reliable sources in different areas in Gabon and abroad, which largely declare me the winner. I am now waiting for the competent authorities to announce the official results. When Bongo was officially declared the winner, there were violent protests. Gabon is now the third African nation where sons have succeeded their fathers in supposedly democratic countries. As Gabon said goodbye to Africa's longest-serving president, Madagascar welcomed its youngest.
Early in the year, tens of thousands of Malagasy staged protests against the rule of President Marc Avalomanan, much like they had protested for him in 2002, when he'd been declared the loser of a disputed election. This time there was no vote, but the mayor of the capital, Andrew Rajoelin, wanted Ravalomanan impeached for not running the country properly. More than a hundred people died during the street fights and scores more were injured. And in the end, Ravalomanan resigned and Rajoelin took power. A power-sharing solution is still being negotiated. The change in leadership in South Africa, meanwhile, was long in coming. In April's presidential elections, Jacob Zuma won, as widely expected. Zuma stood for the ANC, the strongest party and in power since Nelson Mandela took office. Zuma's rival as ANC leader had been former President Thabo Mbeki, who sacked Zuma in 2005 because he faced corruption and fraud charges. But two years ago, the ANC elected Zuma as their leader, and in 2008, Mbeki was pressured to resign as president after the High Court said that there had been political meddling in Zuma's graft trial. Already, Zuma is having to deal with South Africa's worst recession in decades, with strikes and sometimes violent protests, as people in townships took action over what they called unacceptable living conditions. Next door in Zimbabwe, life has also been tough for many, with an economy that's been in freefall for years now, although it is set to grow this year for the first time in a decade. A power-sharing deal this year, giving opposition leader Morgan Changarai the post of Prime Minister, brought some hope. But he's now threatening to resign because President Robert Mugabe is still very much in control. Somalia's president faces even bigger problems, not just a dysfunctional economy, but also almost daily violence. Sheikh Sharif Ahmed was elected in January the same month that Ethiopian troops withdrew from Somalia after two years. They'd faced heavy fighting from the Islamic Courts Union, headed by now President Sheikh Sharif Ahmed, and the Al-Shabaab militia, his allies until he became president. The fighting has since continued, with the Al-Shabaab now fighting the government. Meanwhile, Somalia's coastline has become internationally feared, as pirates hijack ships for million-dollar ransoms now frequently as far away as the Seychelles, 1,300 kilometers from Somalia. NATO warships are trying to protect the shipping route, but there seems to be no stopping the pirates, with more attacks this year than last. And the West, which for so long turned its back on Somalia, is now feeling the effects of its lawlessness firsthand. Another country with a reputation for lawlessness, the Democratic Republic of Congo, has also seen no end to the fighting this year. Former enemy and eastern neighbor Rwanda sent in troops in February, now as Congo's ally, to try and put down a Rwandan Hutu rebel group based in eastern DRC. But human rights groups say that it just made things worse with reprisal attacks forcing even more people from their homes. At the same time, Uganda Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA rebels, seen here in file footage in Sudan, have now moved into northern DRC, attacking the local population there. The United Nations has its largest peacekeeping mission in the world in Congo, but the size of the territory means they're unable to effectively police it, and there's now strong pressure on them to leave altogether. Ultimately, it has to be up to Africa's leaders to solve their country's problems, and perhaps put the interests of their people before their own. Until then, the continent's rich resources will continue to serve those with power, and they'll do whatever it takes to hold on to it.